One of the things I wanted to ask you, Julian, was um, how you see philosophy um, as augmenting psychotherapy. Because I know, as obviously you said um, in the in your introduction as well, that you are a psychotherapist as well as you being a philosopher. Do you do you draw upon philosophical ideas, or do you feel that um, you know being overly conceptual is not necessarily conducive to what helps a, an individual? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know what I'd say is that. I'd say that philosophy, so that psychotherapy should be taught as philosophy. And that one of the biggest problems in the mental health field today is that the, the dominant clinical approaches, psychology, psychiatry, they're taught as hard sciences or well, psychiatry is a hard science, which, I mean, if you look at Elam's work, you see um, how that's changed in the last 50 years that today psychiatrists are uh, almost entirely biochemically driven because of, again, more economic incentives in a system where it just doesn't make sense to practice as a psychodynamic psychiatrist these days because no one can afford to see you mm. because you cost $1,000 an hour. Um, but you can see your clients for 10 minutes and dole out prescription medications, right? So we see how psych like psychiatrists have been shaped by a sort of biomedical reductionism um, connected up with you know, economic incentivization of pharmaceutical driven solutions to problems. Right. Psychologists are not remotely trained in therapy anymore. Um, and instead they are generally taught a number of protocol based short-term manualized interventions um, all based in cognitive behavioral frameworks, which again are very remote from psychotherapeutic work as it's been traditionally understood. Instead, of, are based in working, yeah, you know, in, with ideas that begin in the positivist era in the 50s and 60s. Um, again, wrapped up in biomedical scientific um, perspective on on health and well being, which again is so alien to understanding therapy. Um, as it's traditionally been conceived. Counseling and psychotherapy, to my mind, is the best situated um, discipline or disciplines to really work with, to work with the healing potential of therapeutic relationship or relationship in general, to work directly with phenomenal experience, to work with consciousness, and to draw upon the wisdom traditions that have been cultivated for thousands of years, it's lost in the other disciplines, you know? So I trained as a social worker before I trained as a psychotherapist. So I had a master's in social work, great discipline. It, it also engages with the humanities, mm -hmm. social work, um, and at least attempts to work structurally with systems. But the problem is psych social workers also have no experience with psychotherapy or counseling, no experience with how to work through relationship to heal and support people. Mm. So yes. So to my mind, the problem in counseling and psychotherapy trainings is when they try and take a leaf out of the book of psychology or clinical psychiatry and, um, and orient towards a sort of scientific reduction, right? At its extreme, which unfortunately is really common today, um, you get, psychology trainings where people will have literally no triad practice or training in what it is to use relationship to support someone right. an entire degree with no first-hand experience of actual therapy yeah um, so we want to steer away from that and philosophy is the best way because it begins in um exploring you know before there was before there was psychology and psychotherapy and psychiatry there was philosophy and philosophy was the praxis for supporting people to heal, um, to understand themselves. So yes, I think philosophy is vital to how we teach um, psychotherapy and counseling. Yep. And that informs how I work with it. However, in therapeutic practice, I do not think therapy is philosophy. And that's a real problem that some people make. In the States in particular, uh, you see you see the emergence of philosophical counseling, which again, I think is a bit of a misunderstanding, right? Like we don't heal, we don't heal by having um, Nietzschean philosophy explained to us. Right. We don't heal by being given some quotes by Kierkegaard on our specific problems, right? Like 
we heal through therapeutic relationship, which has a lot of complex layers to it, which are philosophically informed layers. Mm. Right? So I, I think we want, we, what we really want is the philosophy of psychotherapy, which opens up a whole host of interesting subjects um, rather than philosophers just applying their trade and saying they're counselors or psychotherapists, because that's a different thing. Yes. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. God, there's too there's so many things we can go off there. I think one of the things, and uh, you'd be able to speak to this, of course, but I think one of the challenges that um, counselors and psychotherapists face as sort of emphasizing the relationship, you know, being the, the instrument that heals, you know, and then um, there's, I've got a quote on my website, which is, an, of course it is, right? A Yalom um, quote, which is the act of revealing oneself fully to another, yet still being accepted may be the major vehicle of therapeutic help. I think yeah. that's in a nutshell kind of what we're describing here. And I think, you know, we, because we live in an economic system that um, really values uh, outcomes, uh, I, I think we're always going to struggle with that. CBT is a very outcome derived therapeutic framework, you know, by the end of this many sessions, I mean, insurance companies love it, <laughs> of course, you know, but I think the, the ultimate healing, I can speak to this personally, you know, I, I don't feel personally that any of my ailments, you know, the, 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 the issues of my mental health um, struggles in my early twenties have ever really gone away. I've just been able to sort of surrender to them and therein lies the paradox. And I don't feel like I have those issues anymore, but, but to say that I've sort of overcome them, you know, or that, that I've been through a specific rigid process um, where week by week I've become a little bit more healed. It just doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, totally. And so much of this, yeah, I think as you're, as you're pointing towards, it relates back to how we fundamentally understand therapeutic change. And within a cognitive behavioral framework, change is conceived through, you know, adapting behaviors um, and redressing maladaptive beliefs. But then the mechanism to achieve that is through adapting behaviors and redressing maladaptive belief. The problem is that we really know on an individual basis and through firsthand experience that that is not what actually drives therapeutic change. Like on perhaps in certain concrete examples and situations, yes, you can use reason to understand how your beliefs are irrational and how you should act differently. Or you can condition yourself as, as one might condition Pavlov's dog, you know, to respond differently to stimulus. But as you're saying, what does it mean to be seen fully in yourself by another and accepted, you know, and that seems reductive, but it's actually a profoundly difficult challenge to learn how to hold that. Yes. <clears throat> it has a lot of complexity to it, but it also roots down in our understanding of development and formative life experiences where very few people really receive the level of attunement, safety, protection, nurturance, care, you know, express delight in their presence, playful collaboration, like these, these core needs that we have in early life for d deep attunement, right? Mm. Which can facilitate the ability to, to heal and, and not just heal, but ultimately model ourselves, mm. right? So I talk a lot about the internal working model of self world and other you know drawing back to attachment theory and, and bowlby's early work because these these maps we form of ourselves we carry forward and shape the rest of our life and, and we look at this is one interesting thing around post-structuralism and postmodernism is at least a recognition of the constructed nature of reality via certain narrative models mm. right so if we think about how we carry forward models that shape our perception of reality and therefore, in fact, shape our enactment of reality, um, then I think we can really understand how reparative approaches to those underlying models through new relationships, through essentially either clearing the transference, the transference cure and attachment repair, however you want to frame it, mm. how beneficial this can be.